Trauma becomes the political unconscious of the present, belated, relocated sedimentation, whose very ineligibility blocks its working through. Now, narrowly therapeutic conception, such as concept of the working through something, working through, cumbersome, this cumbersome but clarifying definition from William F. Pinar's What is Curriculum Here? Is in general an articulatory practice with political dimensions. To the extent one works through trauma and its symptoms on both personal and socio-cultural levels, one is able to distinguish between past and present and to recall in memory that something happened to one or one's people back then while realizing that one is living here and now with openings to the future. It is such complicated conversation. Acknowledging the trauma of historical experience while never ceasing to articulate its character and effects that reactivates the past and the present. My history begins here, being an African. I moved from being an Afri African to being a captive. I moved from being a captive to being called a slave. I prefer enslaved person. and some were free persons of color. Move from that to being called colored, <coughs> Negro, Afro-American, Black, and now the ever-loving PC term of African-American. Okay, now how many of you in here that identify as a white person just, this is confusing. You can be honest. This is confusing to people who are not white, okay? But what this is, is a search for an identity, okay? This is a search for, this is a search for an identity that is still going on today among your colleagues, among your students, okay? This search for identity, the absence of knowing this trajectory can cause some problems for you as a person who's guiding students and for the students themselves. It's an absence of consciousness about who one is, where one belongs, how one fits into society, the choices that one makes based on the historical to the present and what lies ahead for the future. Same thing, PhD said. I'm trying to learn how to talk like him and write like him. Okay? <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> As an African, the African continent is extremely complex. There's pre-colonial Africa, there's uh, colonial Africa, there's post-colonial Africa, there's neo-colonial Africa. There's all of these things going on with the continent that we're just gonna say we came from Africa. Okay? Leave it at that, all right? As I say, that's a whole other show if we have to go right there, okay? Now, when we talk about captive, what we're saying here is that there were tens of thousands or millions of people over a 246-year period of time, speaking just for the United States of America, okay? A 246-year period of time were brought to this country as the free labor source. Well, I'm from in the South, we say words like free labor, you know, people are get oh, wait a minute, what's going on? You know. But let's, we have to keep it real. Racial issue, slavery. Economic issue, slavery. Okay? All of that is tied in together. 
To be a captive meant that you were taken from what was familiar to you, taken from all of your cult customs, practices, your mother, your father, the system that you were brought into, okay? Everybody wasn't walking around, you know, naked in Africa. The people were civilized and had a system of operating and doing things. Because if you're hungry, you're going to feed yourself, right? You're going to learn how to hunt. You're going to learn how to uh, do agriculture so that you can feed the, the, the village, the elders and the young, okay? So when we use words like primitive, we have to be very, very careful in what we mean when we say primitive. Because these were people that were thinking human beings. Okay? And they were brought into this system of slavery. And this system of bondage, we know it as uh, the trip. The, the trip being across the Atlantic Ocean. We call it the Middle Passage. In certain black communities, we call it the Myopla. Some people will call it the Black Holocaust. To compare and contrast what happened with the Jewish population of people during World War II and before, and so forth and so on. The commitment to never forget what happened to them is ever present in our day to day. Say something messed up about a Jewish person and watch what happens. Anti defamation leave will be at your doorstep, okay? Knock it. What'd you say? What, what, what'd you say? But say something about my people. People probably laugh and go on about their business. Not even acknowledge that, you know what, what you say could be extremely wrong. Because we haven't brought it home yet. That these are human beings. These are my people. Okay? And when I say my people, I'm not talking about my distant. Because I'm one of those real unique kind of people. My grandfather was born in 1870. He was 66 years old when my father was born. He, my father is the third set of children in the third marriage. <coughs> my so I have a grandfather that was born five years after the Civil War began, uh, was ended. So they were still debating 13, 14, 15, all of that when my grandfather was born. He, came, he was coming of age, Plessy versus first. Okay? So you have to think, what, what, what was that black man going through? If we can acknowledge that diabetes runs in the family, if we can acknowledge mental illness runs in the family, we know we can trace that DNA, that chain, all the way back to tell us where we came from, Neanderthal man and uh, Lucy on the, in, in Tanzania and so forth and so on. We have to begin to understand the generational issues dealing with race and racism in the United States. And it's not done to say, oh, black people just trying to make excuses. No, we're not trying to make excuses. We're dealing with this right here, this trajectory, and the historical implications of how we define who we are in this country and our worldview. Because when we start talking about the 21st century education that we're supposed to be giving all of our students here at Mercyhurst, at Purdue, where I work, and all over the United States of America. What is the 21st century education? What does that mean? Is it just the introduction of ever-changing technology? Is it the introduction of new ways of thinking critically about problem solving? What is this 21st century model of education and curriculum that we are supposed to be embracing and passing along to our students? Okay. A person like me is going to tell you, yeah, it's technology, but you also have to deal with human beings. You have to deal with where people are from. You have to understand where they're coming from before you can offer them resources that are going to best help them, guide them, serve them. Okay? So I'm talking to faculty, administrators, students, everybody is a part of all of this process. Okay? When we talk about captive, and once we got here, 1619, Jamestown, Virginia, the first ship called the White Lion, I read way too much, by the way. The, the sh a ship called the White Lion <laughs> dropped off the first 21 Africans at Jamestown, Virginia. Some of them were moved into being free. 
indentured, and then free. One person was held in slavery forever, and that was because he refused to become Christianized. He was Muslim. So the battle going on between Christians and Muslims has been going on for quite a while. Okay? The issues of race and identity have been going on for quite a while. And one of the reasons why we are still having this conversation, and I don't know if in y'all's face today why y'all eating that chicken that looked real good. Is <laughs> 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 because it is a difficult and painful process to go through to even learn how to talk about race. One of the most powerful questions a student ever asked me was, uh, do I say black or African American when I'm talking about black people? I'm older than I act. And I have to meet these young people where they are. If they've never been taught anything K through 12 and how to get along with other people from different races, cultures, backgrounds, to understand where people come from, to understand that people give value to things, to their situations, to their homes, to their families, we're going to have a problem when they get to us in higher education. We have serious talk. So how do we introduce race and racism to the little ones right here? Five years old, six years old. Your mind gonna tell you she, she got it. <laughs> so far. She, she'll, she'll let you know a couple of things. You go along the wrong way. Okay, I'm gonna say down south. Okay? But how do we introduce that to young people? Do we do it by difference? They recognize difference as early as what? Months old. They see the difference in color. They see the difference in shapes. They see the differences in skin color. But if we say, Shh, mommy, is that a black person? Shh, shut up. <laughs> mommy, is that a white person? Be quiet, go, shut up, Ooh, come on, come here. <laughs> Not the way to handle it, folks. Not the way to handle it. When they ask about the differences, we have to say, yes, that's a white person. Yeah, that's a black person. It does backfire every once in a while. But we were traveling, and my daughter said, uh, the lady came from behind the counter at the KFC. She said, may I help you? And she said, oh, mommy, she's real black. <laughs> I said, yes, but isn't she beautiful? She said, yes. I said, OK. I was so happy I could think quick on that because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. Because black people come in different shades, okay? And it's it's uh, everybody in here has melanin. Black people just has they we have higher concentrations of melanin in our skin, and that's what gives us our skin color. But I guarantee you, if you need O positive and I'm O positive, you'll take my O positive to stay alive, my blood type, right? So we have to understand that race, social construct. We, society creates this thing. And when we began to talk about black folks and slavery and free persons of color, we're going to understand that we are, I guess everybody in here, we are in the United States of America. We are citizens, permanent residents, visiting whatever your status may be. You have to understand that it is woven into the very identity of America that black folks are other and not really American. Not really. I mean, they're American because they were born here, but they're not American. There are these differences. People will hold these differences up. And you're, you're sitting there wondering, what, what, what happened? Why, why wasn't I able to do this or get that? And it's because you weren't American enough. Whether it was 1800s, slavery, free blacks, or whether it's recent immigrants from the Middle East, post 9-11, in the 1940s, who was? Y'all you know, didn't know it's going to be pop quiz time, huh? <laughs> who, got, who, who got othered? The Japanese. Because when they dropped the bombs on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, they rounded up Japanese Americans and Japanese immigrants and put them in internment camps. Took their property and so forth and so on. And they were given those, they were given reparations for their property and things being taken. 
So at some point, you're going to have non-white folks in this country who may have a beef with white people, but it's really not you personally. You know what it is? It's white supremacy. You may have people that are stuck in this place where they say, oh, it's the white man, it's the white, no. It's this idea, notion, and concept of white supremacy. That's where the anger should be directed, not at individual white people, okay? Everybody in here could be mad at white supremacy, but it's not healthy for everybody to just be mad at a person because they're white. Anybody in here can be, you know, upset with uh, black people who say, no, I'm supreme because I'm black. Hmm, I don't agree with that. But you just can't be mad at people who have these feelings about people just because they're black. And I'll be very, very brutally honest with you, I'm from the South. And we, we do things a little different down there. First and foremost, if you don't eat grits, I don't trust you. <laughs> we'll start there. We'll start there. And I've heard relatives say they will not use a black plumber or a black electrician because they did some work on the house and the work turned out to not as good as it needed to be. So the, thought, the, the theme is to go find you a white farm. Always use the white folks for that, okay? So when we begin to talk about race, I need everyone to understand that there's some internal stuff going on, there's diversity inside of being black. Every black person is not gonna come from the same experience at all, okay? So when we move from slavery to colored, early 1900s, post Plessy versus Ferguson, to Negro. Negro can also mean, in, in the words of Amir Baraka, mean non-citizen. Because you're still, at this point in time, we're still trying to fight for rights that should have been given because we were born in this country. But they were not there, okay? And if you want to, to know some, uh, a secret, it may not, everybody may not know, Slavery didn't end with the Emancipation Proclamation. It just shifted and changed forms. The re-enslavement of African Americans, Civil War to 1940s, in the form of the creation of laws like vagrancy, talking too loud in front of a white woman, all those things that were kind of targeting African-American men. You get arrested for vagrancy, you're gonna have a $12 fine. If you can't pay that $12, you have to stay in jail. When you're in jail, you have these people that run the coal, coal factories, the coal mines, will come and lease you out to work in the mines. And then if you have some kind of infraction while you're working with them, you just stay in jail over and over again. And when I was young, I once heard my father say hard labor. I didn't know what it meant. But that's what he was talking about. So the leasing of people from the local governments to work in coal mines, right outside Alabama and other places, this is very real. This is another version of enslavement for African American males. Slavery by Another Name is the name of the book that you can read, okay? And The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander takes that book even a step further by saying the prison industrial complex has millions, disproportionately, has millions of African Americans and Latino males in jail. <clears throat> so when we see these things that happen in society, and we look at these statistics that go on, and we ask ourselves, how do we get to this place? And what is my role in making sure that all of the students I encounter, not just the black students, all of the students I encounter become familiar with the history of African Americans in this country? Because when you become familiar with that, you become familiar with the system overall, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there's going to be good, there's going to be bad, and there's really going to be some ugly. <laughs> So the process begins individually. I created this workshop. It's called Deciphers. 
And the D Cypress, could you give me a time check to, to let me know when it's, uh, uh, I need to shut up, basically. <laughs> so the D Cypress workshops just take these nine circles. We call them ciphers. A cipher is like a zero in mathematics, or it's a secret code of writing a cipher. Um, and um, I also liken it to the, uh, the Mobius strip. Um, don't ask me anything about algebra, geometry. Don't do that. <laughs> a Mobius strip, if you take a piece of paper, a thin strip of paper, and you bring it together, but before you bring the ends together, you, you put a little twist in it, and you tape it, and then you cut it down the middle, it gets bigger. And if you cut it again down the middle, it gets bigger. It keeps expanding, okay? Until you can, if you can cut it so very, very thin, how many times you cut it, it's going to expand. So I like to think of these as ciphers or a little bit of Mobius strips because the opportunity to expand and grow is always present with this workshop. They're numbered. And inside of each circle is a symbol. The first one, x plus y to the fifth power equals self. You're going to define yourself in that one. r to the sixth plus A equals environment. You're going to define yourself, then you're going to de define your, your surroundings. So X is your name. So X for me, X equals Jolivet Anderson Duane. That's a mouthful. <laughs> y to the fifth equals five questions I'm going to ask myself about myself. So you need to ask yourself five questions about yourself, all right? We'll keep it simple. Who am I? What is my purpose for being here? We just say, what is my purpose? Where did I come from? Who, what, where, when? When will I be able to live the American dream? We say American dream, okay? And why am I here? Which would be different from where did I come from, okay? So you ask, answer those five questions about yourself, okay? You can make these questions be anything. If you're teaching English, if you're teaching math, whatever you're teaching, you can develop five questions for the person or the student or yourself to answer, okay? Once you answer these questions, and it can be a sentence per question, a paragraph per question, a page per question, however you want that to happen in the amount of time that you have to work with. When you answer these questions, you're safe inside of this zone right here. This is, this is who I am at this particular moment in time based on everything that I've experienced in my life up until this very point right here. When has anyone ever asked us to define who we are? Think about that. We just bounce along, tripping over stuff, tearing up stuff. <laughs> Our parents have to clean up behind us. All right? So you're giving these students the opportunity to, to, to say, OK, who am I? OK? Intelligence begins with questions. You got to start asking a whole lot of questions to become an educated person. And whether you get the answer tomorrow or 10 years or 20 years down the line, thinking is what we want our students to do. We want them to learn how to be critical thinkers. So they need to think critically about themselves first. Okay? Because that's going to be the ongoing, right? So then you can say, okay, now let's define the environment that we live in. So R to the sixth. The R equals references or resources. We'll just say resources. A equals application. So how you tie this together is when I have the definition of myself, okay, and I want to know about my environment, where are some places that I can go to learn about my environment? You can go to your birth certificate. Sound crazy? You can go to records in your hometown. You can go to a family photo album, family Bible. You can go a lot of different places to find out about your environment. 
when I went to my original birth certificate and it said I was colored, I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> 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 I was born in 68. I was still colored. Mm -hmm. So that told me something about where I was, Louisiana, in <laughs> 1968, OK? And it told me a little bit about what my parents had to deal with. Because I know their, their, with their stories. Moving from the rural to the urban, and, you know, being black college educated at black colleges. So the mere fact that they had to attend historically black colleges and universities says something about American culture, American climate, how it treated certain people. You're going to form a whole other university because you don't want black people to go to this university? We have all these, these black colleges that's up the road from all these major white universities. Why is that? Segregation. Jim Crow segregation. Black people and white people were not supposed to meet, meet together. Just wasn't supposed to happen. And these were the laws of the land. They weren't just social laws. They were laws on paper. They were laws that affected who became president. OK? The only reason why Jim Crow segregation kicked in the way it did was because Rutherford B. Hayes made a deal with the folks in the South. Said, you know, get your people behind me, elect me president, I'll pull the troops out. I'll pull the National Guard from down there. Soon as he pulled them, they started white only, colored this. They instituted no schools, blacks and whites can't go to school together. Blacks and whites can't ride the train together. Blacks and whites can't do nothing together, OK? So there's a power dynamic there. That power dynamic is still here, y'all. It's layered. It's layered. It's layered. It has so many layers that we don't even know that something that we say or an attitude that we may have about a person's behavior stems from that stuff that happened then. And it's not calling anybody a racist. That's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying that there are some things that I will say that will be as anti-black as you can think of. Because somewhere down in me, I had to unteach myself what I've been taught about black people, and I'm black. Now, if you, that's layered. <laughs> that's extremely layered. So if I'm struggling as a PhD student, Soon to be PhD. What you think going on with your kids? Mm -hmm. I mean, not your kids, kids. I mean, you know, babies around here. I'm from the South. Bear with me. <laughs> the students. <laughs> I use a whole lot of terms of endearment with young people, so. Mm -hmm. Same here. <laughs> and my style of dealing with young people sometimes can become controversial. Yes. Because I say, Sugar, could you bring me that, please? And they'd be like, Sugar. Is that sexual harassment? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I got bad memories over you. No. <laughs> I will use sugar, honey child, babies, so on, so on. And that's just a part of who I am. And I'm not an educator in the classroom, per se. I educate in public spaces. I do these workshops and stuff all the time, and so forth and so on. So I have to be relaxed. I got to be comfortable to come up here and talk about being a black woman and using myself as the, and my family history as the example. That, that takes a lot of energy. I'm sweating now. You see that? <laughs> <laughs> Once you define, um, you go to resources, and you have to ask yourself, how do I apply the information that I've just gotten to benefit myself and anybody that I encounter? And when I say anybody that I encounter, we're going to Home that in to mercy her. Okay? How do I use what I've learned about myself and my environment to make everything and everybody around me, me first, better? How do I put this stuff into practice? Pinar, the book I read from, he's in Canada. He used to be at LSU. He's like one of the top, he is the top person in curriculum theory. And he has this process called Carrere, C-U-R-E-R-E. -E. And he says, curriculum is a word that simply means complicated conversation. 
That's what curriculum means. <laughs> Complicated conversations like that. Yes, indeed. This is a framework for you to begin having complicated conversations with people. <clears throat> it requires you to do you first, though. I would not encourage anybody to do a whole semester on this until you put yourself through fire, because you're going to take it home with you. And you know, you don't want to have domestic violence and all that stuff going on. You know, it's just, you're going to take this stuff home and you're going to start yelling at people like, ah, you just stressed because you can't figure out this, why, why is it like this? Ah! It happens. But if we can begin to try to find ways to have complicated conversations among ourselves, okay, then be the facilitator or the guide or the jolly, the jele, okay? That's what D ciphers stand for, okay? The D in D Cyprus is D J A L I. That's a West African term. It means real historian of the village. You are the person that's holding, holding the history. You have this knowledge that you need to share with these other, with these young people. You have to guide them to and through complicated conversations. Curriculum. 